Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. And uh, we have a very special guest today, and I'm going to read you a little bit about her before we start. You and me, Park, defected from North Korea to China with her mother when she was 13 years old in 2007. She says in the prologue of her new book, I didn't escape in search of freedom. I escaped for a bowl of rice. And you'll understand that a little bit later in our conversation. Unbeknownst to them, their escape was actually through human traffickers who trafficked them to Chinese farmers. They were subjected to rape and all kinds of violence and slavery for two years, eventually escaping to North Korea with the help of Christian missionaries. The path was through the Gobi Desert to Mongolia. They were told to be prepared if they were caught by the Chinese authorities to commit suicide. So they packed razors and poison in case that happened. They did eventually make it to South Korea and she became an outspoken human rights activist against the Korean regime. Her 2014 address at the One Young World Summit in Dublin, Ireland against the North Korean regime has been widely publicized and her impassionate and deep personal speech about brutality and repression in North Korea has garnered more than 50 million views in just two days. It's more than 80 million views now. Her first book, In Order to Live, came out in 2015 and chronicled her escape from North Korea. She first came to the U.S. with Christian uh, missions and later moved to New York in 2014 to complete her memoir and started attending Columbia University. She received a special visa, visa for individuals with extraordinary ability and achievement and became a U.S. citizen a year ago in January. Her latest book, While Time Remains, is her uh, second book. It will be coming out next month, actually. And uh, the foreword is by Dr. Jordan Peterson. And it really serves as a warning to America about the creeping authoritarianism, the censorship, the canceling, the hatred, the divisiveness, all of these things that are occurring in our country right now. And anybody who's really uh, interested in making sure that our country remains free I tell you, be on the lookout for that book because she has wonderful perspectives. But I want to ask you, you and me, to start about education in North Korea. As a, as a child growing up in that system, what was it like? Um, so growing up in North Korea, uh, at school, I never even learned the words like liberty, freedom, or even love. The only things that I learned in my classroom was how wonderful our dear leaders were and what kind of miracles they could per perform. It was a complete brainwashing. And moreover, even at school, math subjects were like taught this way. The, the textbook that asks children like this, there are four American bastards. You kill two of them. Then how many American bastards left to kill? And the North Korean child has answered two American bastards. And by the way, that's a one word. You were never allowed to say just Americans. It was always mm. American bastards. It, wow. It's almost like the Truman Show, the TV show in America like that. Everything is a lie. Everything is a propaganda. And I mean, after attending Ivy League school in America, it was really not that different. The things were taught in, at Colombia was very similar things that were taught in North Korea. They say mm -hmm. all the problems that we have in the world is because of the American bastards, because of the corrupt capitalism. And so that, that, that indoctrination started very early mm -hmm. in the curriculum system, almost from the very start. Yeah. And continued. 
Well, how did you learn to speak English? Oh, uh, when I was uh, studying in South Korea, when I was in university, I watched American TV show Friends for thirty times from season one to ten, and <laughs> <laughs> that taught me English eventually. That's amazing. <laughs> I thought you must have learned as a child because you speak it quite well. Oh, thank yeah. you. Very well. Now, uh, I understand that uh, there's a lot of starvation that goes on in North Korea. Is that true? Yeah. So, uh, I was born in 1993 in the northern part of North Korea, and regime divided people into 51 different classes. So even though North Korea began in the promise of complete fair uh, equalness, that nobody's richer, nobody's poorer, uh, but they divided the same homogeneous people into 51 different classes. And based on that status, the regime decides who gets fed and who does not get fed. Oh dear. And only the top elite gets fed, and the remaining 90% of population is like long hunger games. They are starved on purpose because the regime using a hunger as a power to control us. That if we are malnourished and if we are starving, we really have no energy to complain or thinking about the meaning of life. And Do that, people actually die? Do people die of starvation? So, yeah. Uh, I mean, seeing dead bodies every day, seeing on the streets. And even my uncle died from starvation. My grandmother died from starvation. And... When I was a child, more than 3 million North Koreans passed away from starvation. And even right now, um, 2023, North Koreans are having even cannibalism. They are that desperately starving. Um, now, if somebody, let's say you knew a family in, in North Korea and you wanted to send them a big box of food, would it get to them? You can't because uh, North Korea is a the whole countries that are concentrated in camp, they don't have internet. They don't even know what's the internet. You cannot write a mail. You cannot write a letter. Uh, they, North Koreans cannot make an international phone calls. It's a hermit kingdom. It's the most isolated nation in the entire universe, I think, right now. So wow. there's no way that we can reach North Koreans right now. And it's... It, has there ever been an attempt by the people to rise up, uh, maybe a coup, and and change things, or is it that they just don't don't know that there's better things in other places? So North Korea is a very different case than even Cuba or Iran. The nation, the people, were so oppressed to the point they don't even know have the vocabulary to describe. There is no word for oppression in North Korea. And I usually say, you know, if you don't know, if you know you're oppressed, you're not really oppressed. North Koreans, they don't know they're enslaved. And how do you fight to be free if you don't know you're a slave? So mm. rising up is not even a concept for these people because they are that much brainwashed and isolated. Yeah. Now, there, your, your father was sent to a prison camp or a detention camp. Are there a lot of those, and, and how do you wind up getting into them, and how do you wind up getting out of them? So North Korea has three types of prison camps. One is a concentration camp. Second is a prison camp or detention camp that my father sent. And then third one is a re-education camp. The concentration mm -hmm. camps are like the Auschwitz during the Nazi Germany. They have gas chambers. They do human experiments. They know People often do not last more than three months if you go to concentration camp, and it's a life sentence. Uh, the crimes you commit to go there is very <laughs> unthinkable crimes, like somebody one day looked at a newspaper, and every phone newspaper has to have a pic pictures of dictators. And you didn't get see, and you saw the back of the paper, and you ripped it by mistake. That gets you sent to concentration camp, along mm. with three generations of your family. You know, yeah, or like watching Hollywood movie or reading a Bible is an execution. And that cares, takes three generations or up to eight generations of your family to get punished along with you if you ever like read wow. a Bible or become a Christian. 
I didn't realize it was that bad. That's horrible. Yeah. My goodness. And how do you get how how do you get out? Of, like your father, he eventually got out of the camp. Do they just like have a a time? You're supposed to serve a certain length of time, and so the reason my father got arrested and sent to an in prison camp in the first place was he was engaging in the black market, and when he says black market, it's not like you are selling drugs or selling weapons in North Korea. In North Korea, free market is not allowed. There's no such a thing called like trading, and you have to rely on government's public ration to survive. But they don't give you the ration, so only option for people is dying, either starvation or try to trade, like selling your old used blanket, you know, sell a rice, and that's what he did. He was selling some dried fish, some clocks, and later mm -hmm. some metals, and that's what got him to send to prison camp and sentenced to more than ten years. And eventually, serving several years in the camp, he was uh, like tried to bribe the guards, and he got out. And thankfully, this was not a concentration camp. He could get out for six days, and there's well, no way out for the concentration camp. Well, I suspect that uh, for the Korean government, the fact that you're out here telling people about what's going on, they don't like you very much, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been on the killing list of Kim Jong Un for quite some many years of my life, and um, but you know, yeah. <laughs> that's a risk. Well, it, it seems to me, just from listening to you and from other things that I've heard, that one of the major functions of the government is to suppress information, uh, to keep people from actually knowing what's going on, and. Uh, have you noticed some of that going on in this country now? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's why I wrote my new book, and also, I am, I am terrified. I have a child that I gave birth in America. He's American, and his first breath was taking this freedom. And after going to university in America and witnessing the BLM protests and living through the pandemic in America, I'm becoming disillusioned every day that is this really the land of the free and home of the brave that I've been getting cancelled, I've been getting denounced for being a racist or being mm -hmm. a Nazi and uh, people telling me that I don't understand what oppression is, what systemic racism is. Yes. And it's it's madness what's happening in this country right now. And you've probably noticed that it has accelerated tremendously over the last couple of years. You know, things can happen so quickly. You know, I think about places like Venezuela, which used to be free, open society. They used to have wonderful times in Venezuela. And look what happened in a relatively short period of time. If you take your eye off the ball and you stop, at, like Ronald Reagan said, protecting your freedom, it's going to be gone. And uh, because it's almost human nature. You give people power, and if you don't check that power, they want more and more of it, and they want to control not only their lives, but they want to control your life, and they want to control everything. And uh, and that was the reason that our founders worked so hard to give us a constitution that would actually protect the freedoms that people have. But uh, as Benjamin Franklin said when he was asked after they complete the Constitution, what do we have here, sir, a monarchy or a republic? He said a republic, if you can keep it. <laughs> if you can keep it. And that requires a lot of energy. And you've been a person who's been an example of that kind of energy. And I want to thank you for that. And we're going to be right back. We have to take a short break. And we'll be right back. And we're back with uh, our most fascinating guest that, that we've had in a while, you and me, Park. Um, and I want to ask you, what the heck did you, th why did you think you could escape? It's a desperation. It's a, when I was escaping from North Korea, as I said, I was not looking for freedom because I did not even know what freedom was. I was like simply looking for a bowl of rice and 
hunger means death in North Korea if you don't eat, you simply die. So with mm. just hope of being fed, finding some food, I risked my life to cross the frozen river from North Korea into China. And with some unbelievable luck, I made it. Mm. And your mother was with you, right? Uh, initially, my mother and I escaped when I was 13 years old. And as soon as we got across that border into China, uh, they sold my mom and myself separately. And so I was separate from my own mother. And, and you ended up as a slave, essentially. Yeah, so they sold my mom for $65. And they mm. sold me just ab above $200 because I was a child and I was a child virgin. And that was very valuable among the perverted like, traffickers in China. So, Well, how did you manage to, to keep your wits about you? I mean, being sold into slavery, being abused, and still ending up as a reasonable human being. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> It's a perspective. I think it's, it's interesting. When I came to America, uh, my editors were saying in the beginning, like, you mean you need to get a, a therapy. You're you know, traumatized. And I was like, what's therapy? And by the way, what's trauma? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that you know what trauma is, that means you're privileged. So, you know, what's the point of surviving it all if I'm going to be just complaining about it for the rest of my life? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, your sister escaped also. Now, yeah. how, how did she manage that? Uh, she escaped first, and then she left me a note to find the lady. And she was also uh, trapped and abused unbelievable way in China for, I think, seven years as a child. She was there when she was 16 years old, and then seven years later, Miraculously, we got reunited in South Korea. We found each other we, when we all escaped to South Korea. So I found her uh, seven years later. I bet you were surprised because you probably figured that she didn't make it, huh? Yeah, I mean, during that seven years, I thought about every kind of scenario. And we really thought, my mother and I thought, like, she made, a lot of people told us that she was raped and got killed. And that's what we thought because a lot of North Korean girls even right now, when we are, we are speaking, there are 300,000 North Korean girls living in China as sex slaves, and mm. their organs are harvested out of them. They, oh, no. they kill them, they rape them, and they sell them. And this is all happening under CCP, and the international community, the United Nations know about it. But they do not do anything about this crisis because they do not want to upset Chinese Communist Party and everybody wants to make money from Chinese economy. So no matter what I am saying, they do not denounce this form of slavery, even though they have no shame denouncing slavery mm. that happened in this country, but they just don't want to stop the slavery that is currently happening. How horrible. Now, when you finally got to South Korea, it must have been a night and day difference, huh? What were the biggest differences? Well, it's, it's interesting. Of course, it was like a, it was. I was in paradise, literally. You know, you for the first time, I was seeing the this nice clean bowl toilet that I've never seen. I have a running water at home. I have electricity. As you can see, if you see the satellite picture of North Korea, it's literally the dark, darkest place in the world. They do not have electricity in the twenty first century, and in South Korea, I was. You know, civilization it suddenly was as it was transported in a different planet. Wow. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, in, in North Korea, uh, do children, are they encouraged to spy on their parents and to report them if they say something that's out of line? Yeah. If they, uh, the first thing my mom told me as a young girl was, like, do not even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. She said the most dangerous thing that I had in my body was my, my tongue. If I slip mm. or one wrong word, that was just not going to kill me. That was going to kill three generations of my family. So wow. we all watch our backs and 
neighbors and there is no such a thing as friends. Everybody's watching each other and spying on each other. Wow, oh, that is very, very chilling. But uh, in a way, isn't uh, political correctness and wokeness uh, traveling us along that same road? Because if you say the wrong thing now in America, your livelihood could be threatened, all kinds of, and, and people are actually tolerating it. That's what's pretty amazing to me. Uh, it's insidious and it's infiltrating uh, in a way that a lot of people can be fooled. And uh, what I've noticed also is the dumbing down of America. Uh, a lot of people are graduating from our high schools, particularly in inner cities, who are functionally illiterate. Uh, they don't know anything. They don't know anything about history. And, uh, you know, John Adams, our second president, said that our system is based upon a well-informed and educated populace. Because those are people who are hard to manipulate and hard to fool. But if you have people who don't know anything, you can tell them anything. And uh, you can say, yeah, there's really no problem at the border, even though millions of people come across. Yes, no, no, no. It's just it's your imagination. No, that's not a problem. And they'll say, oh, okay, okay. And, uh, and, and that's why you need to dumb down the population first before you execute fundamental change. Uh, and did you find that to be the case in North Korea, an attempt to keep people completely ignorant of what's actually going on so that they can be told anything and they will accept it? Yeah, exactly the same tactics that North Korean regime used on North Korean people is being used by American mainstream media and elite institutions and big tech companies. Uh, I like mm. what you said, like I have a YouTube channel too, and I make these videos about North Korean girls are being sold in China. And I mean, they demonetize every single video that I criticize Chinese Communist Party. And the videos that I, what I think about American constitution, why I think this is the best thing that's ever happened to the humanity. I reached out mm. to Google, like, you guys are supporting the Me Too in America. Why are you not supporting the women who are going through the same Me Too under the communist regime? And they right. said, it just does not meet our guidelines to support this kind of message. <laughs> <laughs> it's not convenient for them. Exactly. Now, now tell me about, about these rate education camps. What, what exactly are those? It's, it's, big, it's a lonely thing. Uh, it carries your spirit. It carries your ability to think critically. Uh, and also it just carries you, your physically. It's a very torturous environment. But every day they make you stay up entire night to memorize these verses of the Communist Party. And mm. the point of it is they try to kill the individuality in you. They kill the ability for people to, for thinking for themselves. And only thing they're going to keep repeating and believing is whatever the vision tells them to do. And this is the same thing in America. If you do not believe in the political correctness that was determined by the elite, they, they denounce you as a bigot. And they denounce you as a racist. And of course, in America, they don't send you to prison camp yet. They just cancel you and you, you lose your jobs and denounced by your family members. But in North Korea, they send you a camp for that. It's, it's really sort of a fascinating study when you look at North and South Korea. I mean, they're the same people uh, in the same region. And yet political philosophy and leadership has led to two completely different societies. It's, and does yeah. that tell you a lot about how important it is for the people in this country to pay attention mm. to who they play? and leadership. It makes all the difference in the world in terms of what happens in that country. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you just mentioned that. North Korea and South Korea used to be one Korea. We had a 5,000 years of shared history. 
We are a homogeneous nation. We use the same language. We look the same. With the same ability, with the same history and culture. One Korea, North Korea, became one of the poorest nations in the world. They still can't feed their people by now. South Korea became one of the 11th largest economy with a tiny country. They became the innovative country of Samsung, LG, Dell, like K-pop. They innovating so much for the humanity and the only difference they made was choosing a different system. One was the collectivism, the totalitarian communism, and one chose the freedom and democracy and individual liberty. Well, we'll be right back with our fascinating guest in just a moment. And we're back again with you and me, Park, who has a just the most fascinating story. If you think you're having problems and you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're feeling like a victim, please avail yourself of her story. And I think you'll be encouraged and ready to get up with a spring in your step and move forward. Now, Let's talk about your first visit to the United States. What was it like? Uh, when I came to America for the first time, I actually came to do a missionary work in Tyler, Texas. So <laughs> I didn't land in New York or LA or San Francisco. I, I actually though, I did land in Houston airport and to take a transit uh, plane. And I do still remember being on the airplane, I was thinking, I still had the brainwashing from the regime thinking, you know, they said the Americans are like cold blooded reptile monsters. And in North Korea, we don't have internet. You cannot just go to internet and look at what American looks like. The only thing that we could rely on was the portraits that drew, paintings that drew by the regime. And obviously those paintings looked horrendous. They looked very, very scary. So I had that fear, like, what Americans would look like while they do that, try to eat me or torture me. And I remember just landing at the Houston airport and seeing people in their hoodies and were eating chips and burgers. It was the most amazing country I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine the, the sense of, of freedom. Of course, you'd gotten that sense by living in South Korea as well. And uh, you know, I've, I've been to South Korea, and uh, it was, wasn't really that different from America in many senses, except it was very hard to get around. The <laughs> expressways were moving park, a moving parking lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the food was good, and the people were pleasant, and uh, we enjoyed our time there. But I suspect that... Uh, the way that the, the regime in, in North Korea controls everybody, it's all about indoctrination. And if you can get people thinking a certain way, nothing else particularly matters. And do you think that what's being taught about America and North Korea is for the purpose of getting them to hate Americans? Oh, yeah. I mean, the it's like North Korean education system is like copy the George Orwell's 1984. You know, you need to blame your problem to somebody for them to, and you need to also blame and find a threat and to legitimize why people need this kind of uh, system. So they need to blame somebody or they need to create a threat that doesn't exist. And it's exactly like in America right now, they say they're blaming uh, capitalism, they're blaming white men, they are blaming constitution for every problem that we have. And also they say because that our democracy is now under threat because of the Republicans, that we need, like, we need to control what we can read, what we can see in the media. We need to moni like, monitor our like, social media platforms. An exact same tactic that keep using somehow the re the mainstream media need to protect us from this kind of threat that is posed by the extra right wing uh, groups. And North Korea use the same tactic. They say how lucky we are that we are having our dear leader to protect us from American invasion. Even though mm. America never invaded North Korea, North Korea invaded South Korea. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the it, opposite. It is it is very fascinating, but the the whole concept of political correctness, wokeness. Uh, how did you find that at Columbia, and were you or were you surprised? I just remember my first orientation. Uh, one of the the person who was like in conducting orientation asking us like who likes to read Jane Austen and I I raised my hand I love Jane Austen like the person talked about love and human emotions where in North Korea we don't even know what love is in 21st century this lady was talking mm -hmm. about in 18th century and then my the the conductor was saying you know like by reading Jane Austen's work that's how you get uh, brainwashed. And that's how you become a racist, because she lives in the era of white colonialism. Her work mm -hmm. embodies this kind of ideology that creates systemic racism. Therefore, I need to stay woke to find this kind of hidden uh, darkness, hidden hatred that mm -hmm. is causing all these problems. And I was thinking, like, have you, I mean, it was just, so bizarre, like how twisted their world view was, and mm -hmm. how insane their world view was. And then of course, like in my uh, any just core class at Columbia, the professor was asking, "Do you have any problem studying Western music?" It was required, of course, to take to graduate. And every student was like raising their hands. The problem they had studying Western music is because white men silence all the minority musicians. That's why we don't hear about the musician in India or China. And now we are only studying the biggest of the white men that create the classical music. And why are we taking this class? And I was like, after all, we're in the West. <laughs> What's wrong with the studying some Western music? And as soon as I say this, the professor was saying that you're, I am brainwashed. Mm -hmm. And what, well, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, you were talking about reading the Bible in North Korea and how that is absolutely taboo with severe punishment associated with it. Have you noticed that uh, the whole concept of faith is severely criticized at our educational institutions? It's for people who are weak-minded, who really can't think for themselves when just the opposite is actually true. Uh, it's it's um, um, amazing. North Korean religion uh, denounces all religion, but they became God themselves, right? I mean, the only reason they want to fight off all other religion, especially Christianity, is because North Korean regime copied the Bible and put right. Kim Il-sung as a God and his son as Jesus Christ. And they told us that his body dies, but his spirit is with us all the time. He came with our minds. That's the exact same uh, thing. They were trying to become God themselves. And now in America, they say, even though we, we are in a country where we can support and respect all different kinds of beliefs, they don't do that. As soon as you say, if you say you're a Christian and you like to read the Bible, like you're so close-minded, are you stupid or something? Right. They, they shame you for that. And the, and the whole concept of the family also. Uh, the family is the foundational structure of a society. But if you want that society to be dependent upon the government, you diminish the family also. And do you find that to be the case in North Korea as well? Yeah, I remember the before we ate each meal, the first thing that we had to do was standing up. Every room in North Korea, we have a portrait of the dictators. We have to bow down. Dear little, thank you so much for this meal that we are given today, even though that was not being fed by the dictator, it was fed by my own father who was risking his own life to feed us and protect us. And the teachers will teach us, your father is just biological father, he's not the important father. Your real father is our dear leader. That is the most important father that we need to respect and protect and worship. So, teachers, so when you pray at school, you pray to the, to the dictator and not to God? Yes, we don't know the word God. They don't teach us the word God. So we don't even know the word prayer. We don't even know what praying means. Mm. So they got rid of all those vocabulary in our dictionary. Like in America right now, they're obsessed of 
getting rid of a lot of words because it offends some people's feelings, right? In North Korea, mm-hmm. they got rid of so many vocabularies. Like, we don't know the word stress because how can you be stressed living in a socialist paradise? So they got rid of the word stress. <laughs> they got rid of the human rights. They got rid of the word like God. We don't have the word for love. And Kim Jong-un even banned the mother's day because he was worried that if we love our own mothers, we are not going to love him as much. So he even denies the love between mother and the child. I'm so glad you got out of there. <laughs> it's just For amazing. Sure. And I, I wish that, uh, that, that people could share your experience. Maybe one day it'll be made into a movie uh, so that people can really see what is going on and what happens when you throw God out, you throw family out, you throw freedom, individual freedoms out, you begin to persecute people with whom you disagree, and you could very easily end up with a place like that. And it has happened so many times throughout history if people would just inform themselves of what's going on. And I think your voice is incredibly important. Um, you know, you've actually become quite famous uh, by speaking out at the United Nations, at the, the, the State Department, Google, Facebook. You've given a TED Talk. Uh, but as a result of that, it also puts a target on your back. And, uh, you know, there are people who've tried to cancel you. Uh, they will continue to try to do that because you fly in the face of the propaganda that they're trying to spread. You know, I've, I've experienced the same thing. You know, you're not supposed to come from an environment like I came from and be successful. You know, you're not, this is not supposed to happen because you're supposed to be a victim. Uh, and obviously we need to fight all of that uh, because that's, that's not who we are. You're certainly not a victim. You're the poster child for somebody who is not a victim. And uh, I just want to thank you for being willing to, to speak out and to share with people. I think it makes a big difference. And uh, I just want to ask you uh, for any last thoughts that you might want to impart to the American people. Oh, thank you for all your kind words. Uh, the reason why I named my book Why Time Remains is that I feel that we do not have that much time left for us to turn this back to the country that where it was. I came to the country actually, uh, interestingly enough, when you were running for the office in 2016. <laughs> and I couldn't believe what was happening to you. And anybody, like what you said, disagrees with the political correctness. They completely destroy you and they manipulate the truth. And I was thinking, this country has no mercy. I thought this country was like the land of God with mercy and forgiveness and love. And it became so vicious, like the communist like dictatorships. And, yeah. and living through the pandemic, I had a young toddler who was like two years old. The day opened the dog parks for the dogs to go walk out and exercise, but they would close down the children playground in the summer for two years. And they would make sure that my child wears a mask up to here eight hours a day in a daycare. And this is abuse. This is the most extreme abuse to the most vulnerable population that are children. And because of their ideology, even though COVID was not affecting my three years old, they were making sure that even though adults could go clubbing without masks on, children had to wear masks for eight hours a day. And that really made me realize I need to fight for this country for my son's sake. Because when I was escaping from North Korea, I had a place to escape to. I had America, I had South Korea. If America falls, this country loses freedom, are we gonna escape to North Korea or China? Where are we going? I mean, we have nowhere else to go. And this is the last hope for humanity. And this is the last hope for me, certainly. That's why I'm dying to fight for this country right now. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for your courage to do that. I think it's going to make a difference. I, I actually think a lot of people are starting to wake up 
You know, it's always darkest before the dawn. Sometimes it has to be pretty dark before people can see the light. But I think that light is shining. I think more people are seeing it. And you're part of that light. And I want to thank you and wish you the best. And uh, keep it up. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll be right back with, uh, with my closing thoughts for this week. Well, thank you all for being with us this week and hearing the fascinating story of you and me, Park. It's a deeply personal story, and it helps us to recognize how incredibly precious our freedom is and how it can slip away and how we must truly be vigilant. I mean, when people start being afraid to express themselves, because they may be canceled or suffer some other consequence. Is that really America still? And we have to be vigilant. We have to be thinking about these things because it's progressive. It just creeps and creeps and creeps. And the next thing you know, your whole society has completely changed. Ronald Reagan was right on target when he said we must be vigilant about our freedom because it can easily disappear in one generation. You've seen what's happened just in the last couple of years as authoritarianism creeps in and mandates start coming in. And the government wants to control this aspect of your life and that aspect and tell you you must do this and you must drive this kind of car and you must have this kind of oven and you must eat this kind of food. And that's not America, folks. And the only way it's going to be saved is through we the people. It's not going to be saved by the government, because governments do what governments do. They grow, they infiltrate, they control. It's going to be we the people, and we have to hold their feet to the fire. We have to maintain our faith and our support for our Constitution, which I believe was divinely inspired. And we must make sure that our children learn the right things. So for your prescription for this week, I want you to go to littlepatriotslearning.com. That's littlepatriotslearning.com. And look at some of the video lessons, the cartoons about our founding, about our freedoms, about our Constitution. Share them with some of the young people in your life. It's completely free of charge, by the way. And make sure that uh, you let us know about it. Let us know what you think about it. Let us hear from you. Ben at AmericanCornerstone.com. And uh, make sure you subscribe for your free Apple podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, let your friends know about us. And let's continue to spread common sense because it's no longer common in this country, but we got to make it common again. And remember the cornerstones, faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week. <laughs>